and they're very light and elf-like. We always have this stupid idea of something which is, and every generation recreates it, of something which is traditional Shakespeare, you know, which is doublet and hose and gauze wings in, 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 this, in, this, uh, in this play. And in a funny way, we keep on creeping back to it through rejecting those sorts of notions of the fact that it's an abstract space. Uh, I think people have to, you know, learn again and be told again and again, particularly in a televisual age, uh, that theatre is an abstract place. It's, it, it's, it's a, uh, you know, a square in a circle or something like that. It's an empty space. Speak thou now! Yeah, villain! In this section of the video, I want to introduce you to some notable productions of this century. <laughs> the first of these, Peter Brooks for the Royal Shakespeare Company in 1970, has passed into theatrical legend. Watch how Brooke interprets magic in the 20th century and how he uses the physical resources of the theatre to conjure up his own brand of stage magic. You'll also see how he has influenced subsequent directors. Every word has a meaning and words get debased. Magic has a meaning and has a reality. But that has nothing to do with Conjuring tricks. We start with a brilliant white light, a white background, and all the elements clearly seen. I think for most of us who worked in the theatre, there was something quite revolutionary about the, the dream that Peter Brook did. I mean, it didn't change my mind about the setting of The Midsummer Night's Dream. It changed all of our minds about the, the way in which things could be staged. The fact that the plays didn't have to literally represent what seemed to be mentioned in them. And certainly that's what Brooke showed us, that the fact that fairy flight uh, is mentioned in the play doesn't mean that you have to use it in that way. And what he did was to use metaphors of swings and trapezes and spinning plates on the end of uh, flexible poles and so forth to represent flowers and flight. Um, and the fact that it didn't have to take place in something which literally represented a forest. It liberated us all from literal representation. What Brooke was doing was rejecting a tradition of those little things with wings that had dominated productions for decades. What thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take. Love and languish for his sake, be it ounce or cat or bear, Hard or bore with bristled hair in thine eye that shall appear. When thou wakest, it is thy dear. Wake when some vile thing is near. I had a very strong feeling that behind the play as we know it was something much richer and fuller and I felt that this could come to life in a theatre through using a very wide range of theatrical techniques. So that in rehearsal we'd arrived at this white box and a lot of possibilities, galleries and trapezes and a lot of brilliant colours in movement. The excitement of rehearsal is coming with open possibilities that then grow and develop through the collaboration with the actors. If you look at some of the descriptions, for instance, of what went on in the famous Brook production in rehearsals, you know, it was a Midsummer Night's um, nightmare. Quite, quite often. I mean, there were really, lots of people, you know, had, had moments of intense anger, breakdown and so forth. And then you suddenly realize that what happens in a rehearsal is just like what happens in this play. I think Shakespeare knew that. Help me, Lysander, help me. Do thy best to pluck this crawling serpent from my breast. Uh, you know, that, that people go through this, they start off and they have uh, idealized self-images and then they end up, you know, at one stage covered in mud, uh, attacking their best friends and all that sort of thing. Um, now, 
there can be no ideal production because these, this new set of artists have got to go through that process again. And the important thing for the modern theatre is that you should find time for the actors to go through this process. If they've been through the process, then the audience will come with them. Because the other thing that this play is, is a sort of ritual. It was originally written for a marriage. And so it takes the audience as well on this particular sort of journey. And it takes them through some sort of darkness and then to harmony. Uh, it can't be done unless the actors have already made that journey before them. And eek, most lovely Jew, as true, as true as horse, that yet would never tire. I'll meet thee, Pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. What Brooke did was revolutionary in Britain in 1970, and the influence of this production is still around today. You must not speak that yet, that you answer to Pyramus. Peter Brook continues his quest for living theatre in Paris, and would probably agree that his white box belongs to the past, and today's directors must search for their own dream.